when I was a young man, I did this movie, Dead Poets Society. It was a great experience, but I didn't learn anything. We're going, we don't need I'm going to start with you. Uh, you know, I would imagine it's so fulfilling to be able to take a character and not be confined to just learning about him and playing him for two hours, but over the course of multiple episodes and really getting to dive in. You have played some of the greatest cinematic characters of all time. Thinking about your past cinematic characters, which one do you wish you had had a similar opportunity with to maybe not just been confined to two hours, but really gotten to explore maybe over multiple episodes? You know, wow, what a great question. Um, I did, I, I'm sure, I don't, know, I don't know what people think about it. I did a movie that not too many people have seen, but it was with Antoine Fuqua and I did Training Day. And after Training Day, we did our kind of East Coast version of it called Brooklyn's Finest. Yeah, dude, I love Brooklyn's Finest. I do too. And you know, it was with Wesley Snipes and Don Cheadle and Richard Gere and myself. And I always felt that we made Brooklyn's Finest like maybe a year too soon, that if we had done it a couple of years later, we could have done it as a tent. It needed to be even bigger because the, the, what I loved about that show was the movie was how big the canvas was trying to be. It was, it was looking at the police force from lots of different directions. And I always felt, ah, you know, I've seen a cut of that movie that's like three and a half hours long and, and I, I just loved it. And, I, and as it got truncated, it lost some of its epic quality. And so Brooklyn's Finest jumps to mind. Dude, well, I mean, everyone's talking about release the Snyder Cut. Release the Fuqua Cut, man. Let's get the know, three and a half hour version. Let's, Let's do it. Uh, you mentioned Training Day, and this brings up a question I have for both of you guys. I always love whenever two incredible characters are kind of tethered together for a story, and we sort of see them, you know, each one brings out something different in the other. And I'm sort of curious, you know, Ethan, you had that experience with Denzel and Training Day, but for both of you guys, whenever, you know, you're, you're tethered on screen, what kind of relationship do the two of you have to have off screen so that it kind of translates on screen? Because it really seemed like, I mean, the two of you were just unbelievable together. Well, I would say our relationship was pretty close off screen as well. And it was just a genuine friendship, you know, like kind of like the big brother uncle type of thing where it was, I should say, I should say the father figure that Onion never really had. And it was in order for us to be like that on screen or off screen, we went to dinner many times had so many rehearsals and we had fun together in Virginia. And I think that Ethan became really a lifelong friend, I should say. I sure hope so. You know, I, I, I feel the same way. And the thing you have to understand about Joshua is that this was really hard. I, I've been doing this for a long time and this is one of the hardest things I ever did. It was long, it was hot. We're dealing with some of the most volatile subject matter in this country that you could try to deal with. And Joshua was always available to rehearse. He was always available to run lines. He was always available to ride horses, to do every fitting. This young man worked so hard and I was so grateful to him. And it's, you go through some, it's a little bit like, uh, I don't know, you go through something intimate together. We, we, we were tethered to one another. I was only going to be as good as he was. He was only going to be as good as I was. My favorite part of the series for me is there's an episode in the middle where they really start to see each other as human beings. I stopped just being the old white guy. He stops being the, you know, young black kid he's using to raise money. You know, everybody sees everybody as an other. And then they get to know each other. And then I think the series really takes off. You know, and um, and I, I just, I, I think we loved working together. Well, it, it, yeah. it's, I love watching you guys together. And, and sort of as we wrap up, my last question for both of you guys, you know, what I think is so fascinating about the story is that even though John Brown's raid failed, the, the ripple effect, the repercussions ended up having just a massive impact on the course of, of human history. I'm sort of curious for both of you guys in your career, is there uh, any kind of a, a failure 
like a, maybe an audition that didn't work out or, or maybe a movie or a role or something that wasn't what you wanted that ended up still having incredibly positive outcomes when you take a step back and look at it? Can I go first? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I just think that's the only way we learn. You know, uh, I, I, I had a, when I was a young man, I did this movie, Dead Poet Society. It was a great experience, but I didn't learn anything because everything went so well. You just think, oh, all life is gonna be this paved road, you know? And it's, when the road is gravel is when you learn the most. And every athlete, you know, Joshua is a great athlete and you learn when you get beat. You know, that's the only way you get better. Nobody wants to hear that. They want it just to be perfect all the time. But it's, it's only through, and you know, we had this on set, we had a lot of setbacks. You know, we had things that didn't go the way we wanted. And it's, it's, the question is, how do you respond to that? You know, it, it, we had scenes we were disappointed in, this one didn't go as Dan, you know, uh, you know, if only this, we needed more, you know, all the different things you wish should happen, right, Joshua? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, for me personally, um, there was this project, I think, uh, I'm gonna say two years ago, I was around 12 or 13. And I had made it all the way to network. And I was, I was sure, I was like, that's my project. I know I have it. Didn't end up coming through. And of course, I was super sad because I put so much effort and so much time into it. But it was one of those things where it was like, I wasn't really sad that I didn't, that I didn't get it, but it made me happy. I was like, okay, well, now I know what I need to work on. And if I got that project, you know, I would have probably not been able to work on the Good Lord Bird. So it all happens for a reason. I love that. Seriously. And I love you guys. Hopefully the questions weren't too weird, but I'll try to ask you things. They were yeah, wonderful. Have, I appreciate it. You guys are amazing. amazing. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you for so much for your time. And congratulations. Hopefully the next time we all get to see each other, we get to be in person. I hope so too, man. Thank I you. really do. I hope so too. All right. Be safe guys. Talk to you soon. Um, so to be, first of all, good to see you again, man. I'm glad you and your family are doing well. Um, obviously you have done such an amazing job getting to, uh, give performances on, on many different people in American history, um, obviously with this and with Hamilton. I'm just sort of curious from, from this and Hamilton, how has your perception of American history changed now that you've gotten to see it through sort of multiple different lenses in a way? Wow, what, what a great question. I, yeah, I, I certainly didn't like set out in my career to perform a bunch of historical figures. So like, um, it, yeah, it's, um, you know, what you really begin to realize is that, um, history is is not the way we learn history is not based in any sort of fact right it's based in politics it's based in propaganda and so you you are you are taught what you are taught for a reason when you start sort of playing actually getting to embody some of these people you are forced to sort of learn the things that weren't in the couple of sentences you read while you were in school um, and particularly with someone like Douglas, who wrote so much, and there's so many primary sources, not only his, his autobiographies, which were in their own way a, a form of propaganda, but in his letters written to people like John Brown and uh, everyone who he was corresponding with, where you really get to see what he was actually thinking is, um, it's, it's amazing. And it, it, um, it humanizes history quite a bit and makes you realize that like, we're all, we're, we are all living it and we are all creating it all the time. And you don't know sort of the thrust of your life or what's going to be remembered. Um, but even with the people who we remember, a lot of the most incredible things they did were forgotten intentionally. So it, I don't know, for me, it's inspirational to stop imagining that there is a little thing that I'm doing, right? Anything that I'm doing is part of creating the narrative of the future. You're absolutely right. Well, you know, and speaking of the narrative, what I think is really interesting is that even though John Brown's raid failed, for lack of a better word, it ended up having these massive ripple repercussions that literally changed the course of history. Yeah. And it's sort of this interesting lesson that you can fail and it can still have potentially positive outcomes or very important outcomes. I'm curious, sort of thinking about your career, is there a failure, maybe a an audition that didn't work out or one thing, one thing or another, a failure that, that ended up actually being incredibly important to who you ended up becoming? Oh, wow. Um, I, it, <laughs> yeah, almost certainly. I mean, so here's like a sort of random one, but they, in the Bay Area at some point, they like all of the brothers and sisters plays were getting performed at, by uh, Terrell McCraney, were being performed at different theaters in the Bay at the same time. Um, 
And I really wanted to be in the brother's size. And I, I loved that play and I ran, I auditioned for, I auditioned for all of them, but I didn't get it. And I ended up getting, a, getting cast in like a really small sort of part in, um, in, um, in the Red and Brown Water, the, the first play of the series. And, um, but working on that play changed my life. I got to meet Terrell through it. I met uh, the woman who would become my partner for a very long time in that show. We, uh, you know, it's the reason I moved to Los Angeles, like the, you know, um, so much of, so many of the things that have happened in my in my career, I guess, have been because of just being able to, like, being ready for the moment when it when it comes to you. You know, like that's the thing about being an artist. Like, it, it might Hamilton might never have happened. I was only in Hamilton because I, a, a friend of Lynn's, like, who we ended up being in Freestyle Love Supreme together. Him and I were both called to substitute teach the same class. Like it was a total happenstance that I met that guy and we started freestyling together in the Bay and eventually like that was how I got introduced to Lynn and Tommy, we all became friends. But like that doesn't happen if I don't, if I wasn't broke and substitute teaching, you know what I'm saying? So, wow. um, Dude, I love that sort of like butterfly effect. Yeah. Kind of, you know, where one thing happens. All right, I'm gonna cut, add one more question then I'll cut you loose because I know our time is short. Um, you know, I really love the, the perspective of, of the story comes from Onion. And obviously, you know, the person that tells a story can affect really how we perceive it. If yeah. someone were going to tell the story of David Diggs one day, who in your life would you want to tell it? Like whose perspective do you think would be really cool to hear the person tell your life story from? Oh my God. <laughs> I figured it's a long junk a day. I'm trying to ask you some stuff you hadn't heard 10,000 no, times. Oh yeah, that's amazing. I don't, I don't, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, someone who I don't know, I think is really like the the case. I, I, I would love to, I, here's the thing, like, or I don't know, or someone, I don't know, like one of my nieces or nephews, like someone who's very young, who I don't keep in contact with enough. Um, but I think like one of the brilliant things about it being through Little Onion is that Onion is so young and is just trying to live his life, right? He's He's trying to have his first kiss. He's trying to not die young. You know, he's he's doing things that he's thinking about things that kids think about, and not attempting to change the world. And so that the I think the reason the story that we get is so great through that perspective is because it, it's just about the way you live your life. Absolutely. Well, seriously, David, you're always one of the coolest guys to talk to, man. And you're always so kind to me. And I really do appreciate it. Hopefully the questions weren't too weird. I was trying to- They were it up so fun, man. Today. Really, all I appreciate never it. had any one of those before, so I appreciate yes. it. Yes. All right. I'll take it. Success. All right, dude. Congratulations on everything. And uh, hopefully the next time we talk, we'll get to be in person. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye, guys. Now we're going, we don't need roads.